Right guys, it's time to get Mr. Asarata's take on ReZero, Season 3, Episode 6. We got Priscilla's power revealed. Episode 6 is kind of our first slow build-up episode without really any bombastic action since Episode 1, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things to talk about. We first get an immediate follow-up on what Amelia has been doing as she learns that this so-called husband is the Sin Archbishop of Greed, and should she try to f Our husband. And it was interesting how, for the first time, an Archbishop introduced themselves as... Not like, hello, my name is this, you know, I'm an archbishop representing this sin. Everybody has that same, you know, intro, which I think they learn in cult school 101, right? They must have some schools to teach all the different cult members how to, you know, behave properly to make themselves look good for the witch. But it's kind of curious how they was like, no, I'm your husband this time. And he, he kind of like left that out of the, uh, I don't know, <laughs> out of things to tell Amelia. Because if Amelia found out, she'd probably be a little bit more startled. I flee the wedding. Priscilla will be flooded in response. Hopefully that answers the question of why she isn't just running away that people keep asking. Go back. This so-called husband is the sin Archbishop of Greed. And should she try to flee the wedding, Priscilla will be flooded in response. Okay. Hopefully that answers the question of why she isn't just running away that people keep asking. We finally get an update on what Priscilla and Liliana have been up to as Subaru wakes. Before waking up, he felt like he couldn't even detect his own body, voices existing that were intent on breaking down his identity. There was something deep inside him. A thread that refused to stop fighting the black stagnation, as they both claimed ownership of his self. I wonder what that thing fighting on behalf of Subaru was though. Because in the other cut content too, right? We're talking about how the Olgarms and the Dragon, the curse from Arc 2 and now Arc 6, sorry, Arc 5, all kind of like fighting for possession of Subaru, but there's something deep within that was like repelling that, trying to like retain a sense of identity. Probably has to do with Satella? Something from deep within, trying to protect his identity or something? It, it feels like it could be Satella. The anime displays this with dog witch beasts and the black dragon fighting for dominance, because keep in mind, Subaru does not only have one curse. Mm -hmm. When he wakes up, Liliana tells him that the city- And what does that mean? Right? Why did they specifically show us that it's not just a dragon, but the Arc 2 curse is still in there? And that's a, that's a thing that happened, right? Even though they're all dead and the curse can't be like activated to kill Subaru, it's still dormant. And now we got a dragon curse too. Maybe it's supposed to be like a spontaneous way of, like an unexpected spontaneous way of curses like stacking on top of each other. To do what? Give Subaru beneficial powers? <laughs> Who knows? only have one curse. When he wakes up, Liliana tells him that the city flooded, and Priscilla had noticed this foolish commoner floating around in the water. Subaru notices his leg is still attached despite clearly being bit off last episode, and as he looks under his bandage, he finds hideous Ew. black flesh, feeling no pain in it. There's a funny moment in the light novel where Priscilla gets ahead of him, telling him that they have nothing to do with it, and given his reaction, he wasn't born with it either. She strikes his leg with her fan, leaving a huge gash in his leg, however, the black flesh swallowed it up. It was as if the wound was never there to begin with. He links it to the blood capella dripped in his body, and Priscilla calls it a choice word. A curse, something those mm. from the north are fond of doing. Curse- Gusteco. When are we gonna go to Gusteco, bro? The holy theocracy. They were kind of like foreshadowing the curse stuff back in like Arc 2. ...and re-zero are forms of magic that are made purely to harm. An attempt made to rip off the evil potential of witch factors and arts that were honed for the northern nation of Gusteco. But that's so odd how curses are meant to harm, yet this dragon's blood, and maybe there's a distinction between, you know, the three, uh, what was it? The three gifts from the dragon, right? It's the dragon uh, tablet, the covenant, and the dragon blood. And the dragon blood, based on Liliana's song, it sounds so great. Pills all things, you know, just cures everything. Wow, everything's going to be fine. Growth. But a curse is supposed to hurt. So dragon blood and the curse of the dragon blood, two separate things? Or is it just like a monkey's paw where the dragon's blood is supposed... I don't know. It's just like, obviously there's negative side effects to this. His leg is all distorted. So it's not looking too good, but... Wonder if there's like a difference. A nation of hardship due to the severe weather and harsh conditions. Subaru recalls that Capella called it Dragon's Blood, and Liliana talks about how Dragon's Blood is one of the three great treasures left to the royal yeah. family of Lagunica by the Divine Dragon. In the Dragon Tablet, in Season 1, Episode 12, y'all were right. The whole royal selection, how it all even started. The fucking Dragon Tablet told them. It's like, go gather five girls, randomly. They'll be selected through the... <laughs> 
uh, you know, the little uh, insignia thing. And if it glows red, they're going to be running for, you know, ruler. Uh, it doesn't matter if they don't have any merits or qualifications. Fuck it. RNG process. Dragon's blood grants abundance to lands withered and barren, rejuvenates all destruction that has been wrought, heals the most incurable illness in an instant, and becomes a light to wash away indelible despair. The other two treasures were the Dragon Tablet and the Covenant. Like, based on that description of Dragon's Blood, it doesn't sound like a curse that's supposed to destroy and, you know, harm, but rather like a blessing that's supposed to just, like, make you thrive. It's an interesting question to ask. If you have this blood that can heal anything, and the tablet that can see the future, why did the royal family get wiped out? Because the Covenant. Blood ties. One of the theories that I always have back in Season 1 is that the dragon cannot be trusted. The dragon is here to kind of protect, you know, Lagunica, but what does it really mean to protect Lagunica? To protect the royal family? Maybe not. What if the royal family were also planning to get rid of the dragon due to the burdens of the covenant that they made together? So I'm th I thought that maybe the dragon intentionally wiped out the royal family because the dragon realized that he's going to be kind of out of power soon and he enjoys the luxuries of, you know, the covenant and, you know, this deal that they made and they reside over Lagunica. So maybe he's the one that wiped them out and wanted to just pick new girls. There's also an odd thing how this selection, we did get rid of the dragon priestess, which was like kind of like a middleman, right? There's not only just the uh, royal selection like candidates, but there was also in the past, anytime this shit happened, like a dragon priestess that just kind of got removed for this time. I feel like the dragon is sus. I don't feel like we can really trust them. So that's one theory that I have. Another one now with like, you know, Capella being alive, having Emeralda last name. Well, there's going to be a lot of different theories, but it kind of just goes back to like maybe Pandora. <laughs> just always default to Pandora and say she fucking... Maybe she faked it. Maybe she did it. I don't know. But I don't think that we can trust the dragon, especially because of the blood ties, covenant, and the fact that the royal bloodline was wiped out. Minus Felt and, you know, Emeralda Capella. But Capella is probably not the same person as Emeralda. Unless they are. Then I don't fucking know. Leave any theories you might have in the comments below. Priscilla then slashes the back of Subaru's neck to test if that heals too, and she notes it doesn't, so the restorative capabilities are limited purely to his leg right now. Moving on. Crazy, bitch. You could have poked me in the arm. You could have poked me anywhere else. And you poked me in the neck? That's crazy. To his leg right now. Moving on, Subaru asks where everyone else is, and Liliana points to the distance, informing him of the floodgates opening. It was opened and then immediately closed, but most likely there were casualties. Enraged, Subaru wants to reunite with people at the Muse Company, followed shortly by Priscilla, pulling him down to save him from a demi-beast, drawing the Yang Sword from the sky once again. For the first time, we get a look into how Priscilla really acts. We saw her absurd cruelty in Arc 3, but Arc 5 is showing us a new side of her. her and why is that? Is it because Liliana's around, and her songs and her entire presence, whether or not she has a divine protection or blessing, is making Priscilla a lot more just chill? Did something significant happen between the one year gap, right? A lot of time has passed since we've met her before in Arc 3, right? So there could have been a lot of events that could have changed her. I don't know. I want to kind of believe that Liliana's songs and her just her barred presence is affecting Priscilla, like how she affects everybody else. Respect for the arts and her going out of her way to save lives. And now we even get to see a glimpse into her true combat capability. There will be Also, another thing is just because Priscilla was being an asshole and, you know, calling like Amelia halfwit and being very hostile, right? It doesn't mean that she doesn't, she can't like save people. Like both things can be true. She can still be an arrogant, pompous asshole, but at the same time knows that she wants to, you know, save her subject. So I don't think that's like a contradiction of action. Be a lot more to see from Priscilla's arc. So if you hate her in season one, give her a chance here. The group arrives at a shelter and everyone inside has a potent fear. It's overwhelmingly quiet. It's an atmosphere that can't help but take Subaru as well as he feels anger. That's when he realizes this Wrath. entire shelter is under the effect of Sirius' soul washing. And if it's this shelter, who knows how many? The threat shows itself as a fight begins to break out inside the shelter, but they are brought back to their senses by Liliana singing, the sound shattering the rage and grief that had gripped this place. Subaru felt himself be freed from the emotions of Wrath's invisible web. Remaining was a thunderous round of applause. The people of the shelter thank Liliana, but Priscilla ignores that and asks about Wrath's authority. The shelter plan of Pristella has entirely backfired, causing mass feedback loops inside. It reveals the devilish lie of Sirius. Her power was not one to allow people to understand each other as she claimed. It was a power that forced people to isolate themselves and feel alone. <laughs> After this, Subaru opts to head to Muse Company. We cut back to Amelia.
that was kind of odd. I mean, we had, you know, other explanations from the cut content explaining how soul washing, well, yes, it definitely can unite the hearts, right? But after all that happy moments and stuff, the more that people get depressed and isolated because of the events happening around, they're going to start to really start to hate each other. So now I think the hearts are still united and the unification stems from hatred for each other. Therefore, they're all just saying, fuck off, go away, leave me alone. Who is basically being interrogated by Regulus, but she manages to lead him away for now. We get further info on his wives, and how he has 291 of them, but many of them have died, so with Amelia included, he has 54 wives remaining. While Amelia starts to leave, Regulus accepts responsibility for not noticing how tired Amelia was, but the one who bears greater responsibility would be the one who guided her here, firing a shot at 184's head. Crazy. Amelia doesn't just let this stand, however. She jumps out and pushes her out of the way of the shot, saving her life. As Reg And like the funniest part about that is how I thought Regulus was like, oh, there is a way to kind of like converse and, you know, have him just chill out. And him apologizing for, you know, Amelia being worn out was like, oh, okay, cool, we can work with this. And then immediately he just fucking snaps. He's so volatile. And then immediately, well, someone did this. Uh, your attendant, 184, it's your problem. Fuck you. Regulus simply just says, sorry, and then leaves. 184, however, does not feel righteous anger about this. She simply starts cleaning up. She even smiled when the rock pebble thing was approaching her, as if like, this is better than, you know, suffering as, uh, you know, 184th husband, sorry, wife of our husband. I wonder if there's possibility for us to free all the wives and beat Regulus. I, it, it seems a bit ridiculous to assume that we're going to just, like, conquer all the different archbishops. I think that Gluttony will probably be defeated in order to kind of continue the hanging plotline with Rem. With Crucia's, you know, memories too. I think that is feasible. Will Regulus be toppled this arc? That's a bit hard to believe. There's also Capella and Sirius. If all four of them went down, it would be a feat like no other. Just imagine this, right? Like, I think st people still don't really comprehend the feats of Natsuki Subaru as he showed up in Lunica Kingdom during like the most unstable time. And then within like, within like a month, right? Just like the whole White Whale subjugation into conquering uh, Betrigius. These feats are crazy. And now we're taking down multiple, you know, big witch uh, fiends, such as the White Whale and the Great Rabbit, which is just pretty much sealed away. But these heroics are reaching beyond Lugunica. Even Wilhelm said that, like, bro, you don't realize what kind of a hero you are. Take this and now just, like, imagine we have all that shit and now we, like, say Pristilla against four archbishops. Maybe even defeat all four. That will just solidify Emilia's camp of dominance because everyone else is here but if Natsuki Subaru is the one that just like united everyone and led them to victory that will be an insane feat that no one will ever be able to challenge and Emilia's rise to the throne will be solidified like crazy I don't think we're gonna lose I would hope not I mean maybe there's like a bad ending but this the siege at Pristilla this arc 5 what happens after will be so, so interesting. And I want to know from perspective of other characters from other continents. See what they're, you know, what they're thinking. It would be so cool to see different characters that's going to be important in the future from Valakia or Karadagi or Gusteko. To have like, you know, like the One Piece newspaper moments. Something crazy happens, Luffy toppled a Yonko, newspaper gets thread, important people are reading it, and they're like, oh shit, this boy is doing it. Something like that to glaze Subaru I think would be just so cool. Amelia can't understand. He just tried to kill her and here she is cleaning up after him. 184 is unfortunately too broken by Regulus's reign over her life and tells her that if she questions her any further, she will be violating her rights. And will 184 stop Amelia from like saving them? Are they so like ruled under terror that if Amelia tried to like, I don't know, escape or like, but well, she can't really escape right now because the whole thing will be flooded. But if there comes a moment where it's just like, okay, we can actually just like defeat Regulus and you girls can be free. But what if the girls like backstab Amelia out of the fear because of how much like terrorized relationships they've had with Regulus? I hope that these waifus, these numbered waifus could figure out that like fuck Regulus and we can all leave together. But maybe that's hopeful thinking. This is just how some couples do it and she'll have to accept that. But Amelia won't. 
Marriage is something that happy people do in happiness, but 184 rejects that. You can get married even if you aren't happy. This is a really good character moment for Amelia, who, in an arc prior, had been on the path to entrust everything to Subaru, regardless of how much she wanted to do so, to give up her own autonomy, to make someone else feel good, which was of course Roswell's whole plan with her. Now, Subaru and Amelia have both grown to be shying away from attitudes like Regulus in 184. Subaru respecting the autonomy of others, and fighting for a more even starting ground to his relationship with Amelia, and Amelia understanding her will is her own, and while wow. there are people out there that want to take control of it, that's not a good thing, and Amelia will fight for others to realize that same thing. I also couldn't them. help but notice that obviously these women are seemingly referring to themselves as their numbers. Yep. We touched on this a bit ago during the Garf episodes, but get They're all numbered employees, bro. Giving up your name is a sign of respect for both you and your opponents in a fight. That's right. Having the name, I am Garfield Tinsel, the greatest shield of Amelia, right? Like, these kind of these kind of things are so important, but they've been stripped away of everything because they don't matter. Their identity doesn't matter. None of that shit matters. The only thing that matters is that they look pretty for Regulus, and that's it. And now in this arc, we have Garf not giving himself enough respect to say his own name, and now the wives likely being in such a horrendous state due to Regulus that they won't give up their names either, referring to themselves as only a number granted by the incel god. But you don't see anyone saying this is fucked up in the Eminence in Shadow. And Shadow has more employees than Regulus does. Now, of course, Sid doesn't treat the girls like that. Nor does he even know that, like, he figured out in the most recent season that, like, what? The fuck? Y'all have numbers for these girls, right? It's basically Alpha and the main, you know, Shadow Garden girls that just taking in new recruits and, you know, they get assigned, you know, numbers. But no one talks about that. We cut back to Subaru who is running away from a demi-beast until Julius appears to save him, letting him know that everyone has survived and also giving a kind of important piece of cut content. They move base to City Hall and Subaru and Julius walk in to see an unfortunate situation unfolding. Ferris is outraged at the state of Crucian. and Wilhelm has no excuses, wallowing in self-pity. Nah, it's not Wilhelm's fault, nor is it Felix's fault. It's nobody's fault. This sucks right now and we should be blaming the Archbishops. But to lash out on each other because of your projections, because Felix, the greatest healer in Lagunica, could not do anything but simply just heal minor wounds and injuries. It's just like, come on, bro, do something. Stop lashing out at others. Rush has survived, but her state is so bad that they don't want Subaru to see her. Before we can see more, we cut back to Amelia, who makes an ice version of herself in bed so she could do some recon. That's also very cute. It's so Amelia-esque, bro. It's so like Amelia to think that like, oh, I'm gonna sneak out. I'm gonna put an ice version of myself to make sure, you know, people think that I'm in bed. It's just... It's smart! It's just cute! Who makes an ice version of herself in bed so she could do some recon, using her magic to create scaffolding all around the building to sneak around until she hears Regulus through a window. He's talking to someone about how he's going to have a wedding with his bride and has no interest in what the other cultists are doing. Yeah, and at this point, this is Capella, right? Doing. He's speaking with Capella, yes. and we learn that Regulus was against the opening of the water gate, and how it's a violation of his rights. Yes. And because of his anger and how he has a direct sightline to her, he could blow her apart if he wanted to. If only we could figure out a way for these two to just start like destroying each other. I think one of the most clever and efficient ways to take down these archbishops is to use their lack of like unity, other than through the gospel, to like take them out. Gaslight each other, somehow set them up. You know, and then Regulus goes on just killing Capella or Sirius. Who knows, right? I think that would be so cool. But Capella didn't open the floodgates. That shit is like, who did it? Maybe Al. But to calm his nerves, Capella informs him that she was not the one to open the floodgate. Mm. And he just calls her an ugly meat woman before a wife knocks on his door and causes him to leave the room. This is a really... What a professional... I just... That whole dialogue must have been just so funny. Capella and Regulus just talking to each other through this cell phone media. What a ridiculous conversation. I didn't do it. All right, fuck you, meat woman. Bye. I appreciate it, scene because I know a lot of people were worried that when Amelia got kidnapped, she wasn't going to do anything of note and just be a damsel. But let's be honest, how many times has that happened? For every one, you can probably name three where Subaru was the damsel instead. That's just how he is. Current True. Amelia isn't one to sit around and let things happen. She wants to- I don't think this is really Amelia being damsel in distress. This is kind of like uh, ALO, season one. Second half, SAO. Tragic arc, but funny. Asna was in the birdcage. That's a damsel in distress. But she did, like, get out of the cage and find this hidden entrance. And then there were those, like, you know, 
like weird uh, hentai esque tentacle monsters, and she figured out like the truth of what's actually going on. This kind of felt like that. Amelia just kind of you know snooping around, trying to figure out what she could be doing. Also very reminiscent of little Amelia, always you know leaving the house and seeing what Juice and Fortuna might be doing, be hiding behind a tree. To get through to these women and get as much information to Subaru as possible. And now that she knows where two archbishops are located, she wants to get that info to him as soon as possible. Going back to City Hall, we see a conversation between Anastasia, Julius, and Subaru as Anna asks if Betty is an artificial spirit, to which he just readily confirms. Yep. And there's something a little suspicious about her response, serving the enemy. Is Anastasia hiding something from our group? I mean mm hmm I think she is. She definitely knows. I think from the beginning, I thought that it was odd that how she brought every other royal candidate to Pristilla. Why? Simply to give him a gift? Why? It's not just to visit. No, I think she knew ahead of time. Somehow, some way, she had the foresight to understand that Pristilla was going to be, you know, health seat. She even... Wait, who was... No, I think it was Kiritaka that announced, like, the whole, like you know, looking for remains of Tifo and her stuff. But I think that there is something suspicious about Anastasia, and she's not telling us everything that she knows. I mean, what could it possibly be? He also informs her of the Tome of Wisdom, and that he learned this from the witch herself. And it's possible that the witch cult isn't aware that the tomes were burned to ash. Julia says that the people of the city are in various shelters, many of which are being assailed with unease, and that they are doing what they can to prevent casualties, but... Anastasia calls Julius cowardly for hesitating to speak the truth, that people in shelters are dying. There have been casualties, and there will be more to come, and at this point, more casualties are inevitable. So yeah, I mean, that's Julius, the white knight. He's too charming and chivalrous. I wish he would drop that, like when we had the conversation, just be Yuli. Inevitable. Subaru says that Anastasia is misunderstanding something. He will rescue the city, but he has no intention of sacrificing the few to save the many. Anna tells him he's saying silly things. In that case and there definitely could have been a moment where Subaru is being a naive idealist and he has no idea what the fuck he's talking about and simply chasing after his ideals will cost even more suffering. But at this stage of ReZero, with the development that Subaru is at, this isn't Arc 3 Subaru blinded by rage and envy and all these different things. It feels like this is the moment where he can actually be a hero. He has been a hero before too, multiple times. And to be able to save everybody, that is a extremely greedy, greedy option, but a true hero can make his ideals turn into reality. In case, nothing has changed since what he first did back at the castle. Besides, there were also casualties back during the White Whale. Super retorts- Yeah, but like, these are random fucking Iron Fang troops and random people from Crucius camp. There's no notable name death, so eh, we don't care about those deaths, do we? Besides, there were also casualties back during the White Whale. Subaru retorts that those people had accepted to die. They were soldiers, not civilians. Knights are by nature greedy people who want to look- That's right. The resolve, right? They knew what they were going in for. They already signed up their lives. But the civilians here, they didn't ask for this shit. That was a distinction. Cool. He always tries to look cool even if it kills him, and so does Julius, because he is the finest of knights. Mm -hmm. There is some cut narration here, and I don't mind putting this in the non-content section because it's not a spoiler, but I really like it. The narration talks about holding an armful of apples and how you can't hold on to them. Forbidden Appa. Appa mentioned. But Natsuki Subaru was a knight. The things they held were not a bunch of apples. They were precious and irreplaceable. The lives of people. People who could cry and who got angry. That's right. Appa's bad. Not precious. Very replaceable. Go away, Appa's. Angry. Natsuki Subaru has no intention of letting a single one of them fall. Talking about resolve and determination sounds cool, but that's just giving up extra steps. And there's nothing cool about that. Natsuki Subaru is arrogant. He's stubborn, but most of all, he refuses to let a single life slip through his fingers. It's a noble goal. It's one that is impossible to not respect, but... Yeah, and just because you're arrogant, just because you're greedy, it doesn't mean it's bad. I think that a lot of people think that there's absolutes where if you're slightly greedy, slightly prideful, suddenly you're the epitome of that sin. No. Virtues and sins, it's all about moderation. If you're not arrogant enough to believe that you can do this, then you would never be able to even you know, save everybody. It's all about understanding, you know, where you are. The self-reference of, am I falling too deep into, you know, these virtues or sins? I would say that Julius is way too fucking deep into this whole chivalrous act of being a knight to the, to the point that it becomes a detriment, right? 
Just because, again, it's a sin or a virtue, I don't think it means shit. You have to carefully see, like, are they being overconsumed by it? It's also dangerous with a power like his. Of course, Subaru has resolved to not rely on return by death. That much can be seen throughout Arc 5, as even though things aren't going ideally, he isn't resetting. However, the existence of return by death will permanently alter his decision making, which we see a bit slip through when he tells Capella to just kill him in the last episode. Ultimately, Natsuki Subaru wants to be the hero that saved Rem, and that includes doing reckless things to save others. It's something that is hard to impugn him on because it's such a noble goal, but it's one that may cause him intense mental anguish, not yep. even because of the work required to save everyone, which is severe, but because of what he will feel when he fails to save someone, and how that may push him into even more severe directions. Just how much of this heroism will Subaru be able to carry? Well, he's not alone. He has everyone else around him to support him. Even the openings or the endings, right? It has like this final frame of Reinhardt pretty much picking up Subaru by the collar with everyone else kind of like pushing him forward. So I don't think that this over and time after time suffering will make him become like a hollow from Demon Souls or uh, sorry, Dark Souls, but rather, you know, have people to rely on and just move forward. And will he be able to work through the downsides of being a hero as he defines the conditions of a knight? In the post credit scene, we see Amelia sneaking in through the window, picking up Regulus' conversation mirror, and seeing who picks up on the other side, pointing it away from herself. Yep. The one on the other end of Regulus' conversation mirror, for some reason, is Aldebron. And remember, it makes no sense that this is Capella at this moment. A lot of people like to think about the first thing that sounds good and then go with it, without really thinking about the logic involved. If Capella was really Al here, why would Capella turn into Al despite not knowing who picked up the signal, right? Amelia was diddling on the fucking phone, and then suddenly, she turned it around. You could even assume that because Al said, oh, there's a connection, that he's the one that initiated that call. And he never saw who was on the other side. So then, how could you possibly assume that somehow Capella has turned into Al to convince Amelia of something? That just doesn't make sense to me. I think that this is Al doing some suspicious shit again. I think that he's the one that opened the floodgates. I think he's the one that took out the Pristilla 10. But the weirdest thing is you can't have the understanding of taking down the Pristilla 10. Because why would you do that? Because they have the information of where Tiefling's remains could be. And that was the whole goal. The fact that we need to take care of them. To, to, the immediate goal was we need to find them so that no Archbishop takes them and starts interrogating them. Or that shit becomes leaked. So the incentive here for Al to potentially take out all the Pristilla 10 is crazy, especially knowing that they were taken out before the first broadcast even happened. This is the cut content. How could somebody have this idea and understanding of what to do before it even happened? And at that point, if we're still going with the whole Super is Al theory, something similar to Return by Death would definitely explain what's going on and Al has actually died in, you know, these moments when we haven't seen him and he's doing his own thing. I have no clue, but this is beyond suspicious at this point. And I think that this is also another kind of cool callback of Arc 3, the real selection, of how a lot of the time, uh, sorry, a lot of the episode, the most recent one, it was Priscilla hanging out with Subaru. Now that also happened back at the back alley in Arc 3. It was Priscilla and Subaru. And then what happens after? Al and Amelia shows up. And, you know, the post credit scene, we see Al and Amelia. Just a little bit more, you know, I don't know, little, little hints, little Easter eggs that Tapi is throwing in to be like, yo, mirrors, parallels, Subaru's Al, Al is Subaru, swapping the waifus, hanging out. There's something more than meets the eye here. I still can't really tell exactly what that object is at the top. I think that this is Al looking down at a table and we're looking at some sort of roof ceiling. There is a hole at the very top, but beyond that, I got no clue where this place is. Switching up on the assault on City Hall, knowing about Typhon's remains, giving Subaru unprompted advice about gluttony, speaking English, and finally, being on the other end of Regulus's conversation mirror. Al's suspicious activities keep piling up to a point that can't be ignored anymore. Yep. Just what do you guys think he's up to? Let me know. I think he flooded and he killed the Pristilla 10. In the comments below. This doesn't really have anything to do. Another thing is that the flood actively helps us out, right? The Flood actually helps us out, not the Archbishops, and taking out the Pristilla 10 also technically helps us out. The only person that's kind of on our side and would do these things behind the scenes, I think, is Al. To do with the episode, I just remembered that I forgot to talk about the star name meaning for Gluttony, so I'm tacking it on real quick. Gluttony? 
Oh yeah, it's the whole uh, Roy Alford and Lai Batenkaitos about how Batenkaitos refers to the whale, Alfred return refers to the uh, Hydra, which could be presumed as you know the black serpent. And if we're gonna go with the whole Daphne created three big you know witch fiends, and we have the black serpent and the whale, then there is the existence most likely of a third one whose last name will point to the constellation representing the Great Rabbit. Lei Botankaitos is named after Zeta Ceti, a star in the constellation of Cetus. It's known as Botankaitos because it's a binary star system, meaning two stars that are gravitationally bound to each other, with one being known as Botankaitos. It's derived from Arabic meaning belly of the sea monster, and its constellation of Cetus is known as the whale. Alfred is a star in the constellation of Hydra, known as the backbone of the serpent, and of course, the constellation of Hydra is a lot like a snake. Mm -hmm. A snake that would grow another head even if you cut one off, until its neck was cauterized to prevent regrowth. That would be even more crazy because we haven't even seen the Black Serpent yet. We've only seen its venom, the sentient venom that just like absorbs everything and just plagues everything. But what if we actually see the serpent? The serpent is a Hydra. <laughs> and like we cut its head off and it just keeps growing back. Oh boy. Overall, a pretty solid episode. Uh, clearly, this wouldn't be one of the highest priority ones because it was some setup, but it was still good. And I thought that Subaru's declaration was such a cool moment, and Priscilla's Yang Sword was also sick. Even though there wasn't crazy stuff going on in the previous episodes like Capella, I thought it was like a solid episode. The changing time of day has done a lot of good for the tone of the anime. Uh, the orange sunset lighting and destroyed atmosphere coupling the current tone of the arc well. I'm just going to touch on this real quick. Uh, there is another Aldebaran break time, though I can't tell you the details of it because... There are zero official translations for break time, so so I would look out for that when that gets uploaded by Katakawa and and hope someone tra Katakawa ain't doing that shit. They too lazy. We gotta go reach out to the pirates in the high seas for this. Translates it in the comments because apparently we're back in the 2008 era of anime. We don't have a whole lot covered this episode, but we do definitely have some interesting things missing. Okay. First, I believe it was cut, but maybe I just missed it. It was a brief moment of Subaru noticing that Priscilla seemed to be just fine even without Liliana's song, but I won't harp on that just in case I missed it. What do you mean? That she is... Hold on. First, I believe it was cut, but maybe I just missed it. It was a brief moment of Subaru noticing that Priscilla seemed to be just fine even without Liliana's song. Priscilla is just fine even without Liliana's song, implying that it's not really Liliana's song that's influencing Priscilla to be this more favorable towards us? Is that what the implication is? But I won't harp on that just in case I missed it. Another cut was before getting to the shelter, Liliana spurs Subaru into action because she could tell someone was injured, and the two rushed over to a young man who was attacked by a demi-beast, and they performed simple first aid on him. Li oh, right, yeah, Subaru was actually doing first aid and stuff, and, you know, he, like, saved them. It was a pretty cool moment, from what I heard from the cut content. Liliana is surprised he knows how to do that, and Priscilla tells him to carry the man to the shelter. And who taught us that? It was Clint, the monocle blue-haired guy that y'all fucking love, but we barely able to get to see him. She also makes a particular remark. Time and again, you really do seem to be a man with good timing. Yeah. What's up Another with that? cut comes shortly. Yo, no, 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 go back though. Again, that cut content, time after again, you always have good timing, makes sense. If we plan this shit using future knowledge by return by death, but again, look at Priscilla scenes. It's never like that. We always meet Priscilla out of nowhere, and there is nothing that we could have done to predict or, you know, uh, create a scenario where it's favorable. So is this Priscilla's passive? Is it the whole she's lucky thing and everything just obeys? Is, there, is it just Tape's kind of clever way of showing that Priscilla and Subaru has a connection because they just kind of find each other? Because why? Because it should be Al, but Al is Subaru. Is that what he's trying to tell us? With good timing. Another cut comes shortly after when Subaru reunites with Julius. Julius recaps what we had already known to him, but, you know, mainly the floodgate opening, which is the thing removed. However, what he notes is that the floodgate being opened actually turned the tide of battle and saved For him. our favor, exactly. It makes us wonder again, what is going on in this city? The Think about the incentives of these actions done by this mysterio per mysterious person of flooding the city and taking out the Pristella tent. It just feels like someone from our side is doing something suspicious, and there's only one person right now that really points to that. It's Al. The Council of Ten has been killed despite the witch cult going after them for information, and now a floodgate was opened, but not mm -hmm. as a threat, but seemingly to change the tide of the battle. And if we assume that Al is the one that actually did it, that kind of like speaks volumes of what kind of character he is. The fact that he would just cold-bloodedly execute all ten people, they did nothing wrong. It's just that they're a liability. And Al did not take 
if it was Al, he didn't take any second chances. He's like, nope. It doesn't matter if you could be brought to our HQ and, you know, keep you guys quiet. Mm -mm. I'm just going to kill you. Just think about that. And it, it's just like, man, what is Al really about? Like, Subaru right now is saying, I'm going to save everybody. I don't care about, you know, um, your notion that we need to sacrifice the minority to save the majority. No, I'm going to save everybody because these people are didn't sign up for this and they're not they don't have the resolve to be like a knight or some sort of warrior and then there's al who is seemingly just going around executing people which i think is really raw and i kind of think that it's based <laughs> it's just truly like dark is it just dark subaru light mode subaru dark mode subaru what, what's going on with al battle let me know whatever theories you guys might have in the comments below Another couple of small cuts come in the City Hall section. Rick yeah, Ricardo bared his fang at Felix because Felix is being a bitch. Ricardo initially has a strong reaction to the events unfolding with Ferris and Wilhelm, which is cut. Good. And there is mention that Garfield is running around the city in anxiety. Uh, Subaru comes to the realization that City Hall is also under the effect of soul washing. Ferris was grief-stricken. Wilhelm was bound by self-doubt. Ricardo bared his fangs. Garfield was filled with anxiety as he looked for Subaru. Anna was doing her best to meet expectations. That's right. So it's not just like people just lashing out out of nowhere. But most of the times, if I don't see the red eyes in people's like, you know, eyes, I don't think that soul washing is actually happening. But that's like the most really in like heightened state of soul washing. Even right now, if everyone just seems perfectly fine, they're all just like really on edge because of soul washing. And Julius could not break free from his indecision. I just thought it was a nice little moment of realization for Subaru to recontextualize the events in City Hall. That'll do it for this episode, though. All a right. pretty solid episode with some cool tidbits here and there. And I'll see you guys next week for the... Thank you, Mr. Asaratha, for the recap, the analysis, the cut content regarding episode 6. And I think that the most interesting thing about the cut content, right, is the fact that Priscilla says time after time, you're always just at the right spot at the right time. There was also extra stuff I didn't hear about, about how Priscilla seemed to be fine even without Liliana's songs implying that there's nothing really influencing Priscilla right now and we're just kind of assuming shit because of how hostile she was back in Arc 3. And most important thing I think is the person who flooded the city, the person who killed the Priscilla 10. Something is going on and the incentives line up to the point that you could assume someone from our side is going on to do these shady things. And there's no again, there's only one person that is very, very shady right now. Is this motherfucker? I think that's Dark Subaru, man. The more I think about it, I'll see you next time.